great. Really. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Nyland, thanks for taking the time. I, I do appreciate it. The Hunley is exciting to everyone interested in shipwreck uh, conservation and shipwreck search and finding and actually it, it, it's, a, it's becoming an example around the world of how you treat a shipwreck when you do find it and when you do actually get an opportunity to get inside it. One of the really exciting things about the, about the small amount of interaction we've been able to have through your press releases is the amount of technology that went into the building of this vessel. I wonder if, if you take the time to comment on some of the technological advances that you found that might have been a bit surprising to you as you, uh, as you, as you got an opportunity to get into the, the wreck itself. Well, it's, it, it's an amazing project. We brought so many talented people, so many, uh, so many resources and uh, 21st century technology to the project. We're, we're certainly learning a tremendous amount about the submarine. One of the things we've learned is that the technology was much more advanced in 1864 um, than anyone ever expected. Uh, things that we normally associate with submarine development, uh, 21st sub 20 20th century submarine development were occurring in the 1860s in the United States, both in the South and in the North. Hunley is the most famous submarine of this period because it was the first successful combat submarine. It proved that submarine uh, warfare was a reality and uh, was coming of age. Some of the technological advances we found in the submarine is the very, uh, very beautiful, graceful design of the hull. It's a very hydrodynamic shape. Uh, the ends, the bow, the stern are, are very, very fine ends. Uh, actually, cutting through the water, the bow head on looks almost uh, like it has a razor edge or blade edge to it. Uh, so, it, you know, it actually coming at you head on it actually would be a very menacing uh, looking object coming at you. Um, we've also found that there is, uh, we're finding now, we don't completely understand it, but uh, there is a, a more advanced air exchange system than we anticipated. Uh, early on, we thought that they had, you know, they had. Um, uh, uh, snorkel tubes, uh, two, three-foot pieces of pipe uh, that they could bring air into uh, the submarine, but we didn't think these worked very effectively. Now, we've been the last... Doc, we're not going to live through that. Yes, okay, you want to sit back and stop? Could you... It's still rolling. Okay, could you ask them just to temporarily... Oh, stop here. Okay. okay. Uh, all right, we're, we're all here. Well, we'll go back, and we're, we're, you were talking about the hull design, about the about the, the fineness of the of the bow, okay, uh, the, uh, the, and the air exchange system. Well, you know, we've, in the last two weeks, we've seen that the submarine has a much more advanced air exchange system than we ever expected. Uh, we knew there was a what we call a stuffing box or snorkel box, uh, to which on the outside, two three foot long pieces of uh, pipe were attached that uh, were breathing tubes. What we now see on the inside is a very large bellows. Um, that could be pumped either you know, by hand or by foot. Uh, and this bell system seems to have not only pulled air into the submarine, it probably uh, pushed the foul air outside the submarine. Uh, there's, you know, we don't fully understand it yet, but there are rubber hoses connected to the bellows. These seem to go down deeper into the sediment and perhaps even go aft. Perhaps there's even a, a uh, air exchange system that runs throughout the length of the submarine, uh, pulling the air from uh, the, the stern part of the submarine and, and circulating it back. Uh, we, we found that this was a, this position was dedicated to one man operating the bellows. Uh, before we thought eight men turned the hand crank. Now we see that only seven men turned the hand crank, and one man's designated job would be to work this bellows, this air exchange system. Uh, you know, we found too that uh, um, you know the submarine, as far as uh, you know, lighting and stuff, that they were able to. They thought a lot about pulling light in the submarine with viewing ports. Uh, Look around the conning towers, the hatches, uh, and on the top of the submarine, um, the explosive system in which they, they brought a, 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 a mine, a torpedo, to the, to the enemy was quite advanced and perhaps very unique in the Civil War. Most of the um, mines during the Civil War um, were, were contact detonation. In the case of the Hunley's explosive, it seems to be a trigger detonator on, um, on a lanyard. Um, the spar torpedo, um, the spar itself, there was a whole question of how you're going to deliver an explosive charge to an enemy ship. Um, in the, in the, initially with the Hunley and other submarines, they tried towing an explosive charge behind them in which they would dive under the enemy ship, come up on the other side, pull the explosive, 
uh, into the, uh, the opposite side of the ship. Uh, in the case of uh, Charleston, uh, you know, there already uh, Dahlgren, who's in charge of the Union fleet, was already coming up with uh, Union uh, anti-submarine countermeasures, one of which countermeasure would be to anchor uh, ships in shallow water so the submarine couldn't get underneath them. Uh, and if they did uh, explode a charge on them, that ship would, would sink in shallow water and be raised. Um, Hunley, when it came to Charleston, uh, went to using a explosive torpedo on a spar. Uh, this was a, a stinger type of explosive. If you can imagine like a honeybee stinger in which uh, the, the stinger is embedded in the skin and then uh, you know, left there and pulled out. This is the way the explosive charge on Hunley worked. Uh, they put a 90 pound black powder charge with a spear on the end that was barbed. So once it penetrated the hull, it would stay there. Uh, this went on the end of a 17 foot long spar. So the whole assembly was probably 23 feet long or more. Um, this would be rammed into the hull of an uh, enemy ship, the Housatonic. Uh, the explosive left there, the stinger left embedded there. Uh, the Hunley would then reverse, back off, the explosive charge off its spar, um, come back off to the end of their lanyard, their detonator card, pull that, uh, set the trigger and explode um, you know, the enemy ship. And, and it worked very well in the case of the Housatonic. The charge exploded well below the water line. Uh, the ship went down very quickly. Um, and in the case of, uh, it seems like a small thing now, but during the Civil War, uh, you know, very, you know, very rarely did they use a, uh, a trigger sort of detonator. It was more common to use a contact detonator because if the detonator didn't work, they could back off, slam it in again, and uh, have another chance at uh, detonating, not losing uh, their explosive. Mm -hmm. um, How long was the lanyard, and what well, was the concussive <coughs> force of that explosion on the people in the soap? Well, we, we don't know that for sure. I think there's some estimates the lanyard was 100, 150 foot long. Uh, some of the historical evidence suggests that the explosion occurred when the submarine was much closer to the Housatonic. Uh, we have not yet reconstructed the force of that explosion, but it must have been terrific on uh, the men in the Housatonic. Uh, whether we know it was terrific on the men in the Housatonic, they were knocked off their feet on the deck. Uh, the stern section of the Housatonic, uh, which is a 207 foot sloop of war, rose uh, out of the water. Uh, it must have been terrific for the men in the Hunley, this concussion. And, uh, you know, whether that impacted the, uh, you know, the ability of the, the Hunley to make it back to port or, or injure the men, we don't really know. But these are some questions we're certainly going to try to answer over the next uh, few weeks, months, uh, perhaps a year or two or so of analysis. Mm -hmm. It's very clear from the brief look that we had inside that all of the, all of the men, the crew of the Hunley, sat on one side of the vessel uh, and that the crank uh, was uh, operated and really the handles of the crank barely cleared the, uh, the hull on, uh, on what must have been the starboard side, if I remember correctly. Why did they set it up that way, uh, putting all the weight on one side? It just, uh, well, these, these are also questions we, you know, we hope to answer. Sometimes doing archaeology, you create more questions than you answer, or as you answer them, you create additional questions. Uh, you know, there's certainly some, some of the things on it. Concerning the hydrodynamics of the vessel, uh, the engineering, we don't fully understand, because it would seem logical if you put all the men on one side that the weight would all be on that one side, but they certainly had a method of countering that weighting in the submarine, uh, whether it's with ballast or whether it's the way the men actually position themselves in there. As, as you, you know, we always knew that the, s the space in the submarine was very, very small. After looking in there now, what you've just done, you can see that it is incredibly tiny. It's hard to imagine grown men uh, sitting in this submarine uh, and being able to uh, turn the crank and uh, position themselves. We've got to do some experimentation to see how they actually sat in the submarine because it's not a simple matter of sitting on the bench turning the crank because uh, the crank only clears the bench itself by a, by a few inches. So they had to be able to either tuck their legs or straighten their legs in such a way that the crank wouldn't hit their knees on every turn. Uh, also, you know, their, their hands come very close to the opposite side of the submarine. Um, we also found, we didn't realize that there were uh, uh, frames inside the submarine, uh, which, you know, again, is another technological development. Um, it's very necessary in a submarine because if it's going to go to any depth, even one atmosphere, 32 feet uh, below in the water, it needs to counter that compression of uh, the, the, the hull. 
Uh, so the frames, you know, were, were certainly, uh, you know, well thought out, uh, but they also make it much more cramped inside the submarine. These guys had to uh, uh, work their way around the frames. Uh, once they were in position, it's, it, you know, it's hard to imagine how they could, how they could, you know, get out of that position with, with any uh, rapidness or any quickly at all. Uh, you know, certainly after being in this three and a half hours, you could you can imagine be so uh, stiff and stove up that you know it would be impossible to get out. Um, but in the end, the frames, the tightness, uh, it confined the men's bodies in the submarine, which is aiding us in the identi identification of, of which man is, is which and, and where each individual sat. We now will be able to piece together in the future a story of where every individual in the submarine was at the time of uh, the submarine sinking. Uh, we'll probably be able to say who these men were, uh, you know, from the artifacts, from the, uh, you know, the uh, reconstruction of the men's faces and uh, uh, physiques and the skeletal record. So, um, you know, certainly along these lines, the cramptness of the submarine is going to aid in telling the story of uh, these men and the story of the Hunley. I know from discussions with you that you've worked on, on vessels from the Bronze Age up. Uh, have other vessels that you've worked on been as surprisingly advanced uh, in terms of the in terms of their relative technology as the Hunter? Uh, there's other archaeological projects I've worked on that are, that are amazingly uh, exciting. The, the, uh, the project that the Institute of Nautical Archaeology did on the Bronze Age uh, shipwreck uh, was you know, a, a unique, one-of-a-kind wreck. I learned a great deal there. Uh, the Hunley is, 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 is amazingly special, very challenging. It's, in, in one way, it's, you can make that connection between the individuals in the submarine uh, you know, much more than any other archaeological site I've, I've worked with. And that's not, not only because there's more maybe historical information out there, it's, you know, it, it, there is something but from their personal artifacts you can, you can actually make a, an almost instantaneous connection. And for example, one of the first artifacts we found was a military button with an A, an ornate uh, A on it, which immediately we could connect to uh, the art, uh, Confederate artillery unit. We had one individual that we know of that was in uh, the uh, German light artillery uh, by the name of Carlson. So it's, it's kind of a very uh, immediate and electric connection to some of these individuals that I've never experienced before in an, in an archaeological project. Have you ever worked on an archaeological project that had better support from state and federal governments anywhere in the world than on the go? No, I, I haven't, and I think that's one of the amazing things, too, is that this is a model partnership between uh, state South Carolina, the federal government, and, uh, and uh, private sector as well, too. Uh, this has been a project, I think, unanimously uh, you know, in, in South Carolina and the nation that we've gotten support from. Uh, as you probably know, too, we had... Um, one artifact that was connected to a Union soldier, uh, a gentleman named Ezra, Ezra Chamberlain, and uh, we've actually been getting contacts from people in his hometown uh, in Connecticut. So it's you know it's not certainly not just a regional story; it's, it's a national story and an international one in effect too. This whole development of, of what's submarine technology occurring in the 1860s. It's also a very human story too. You think of the, the courage of these men. After you know, it's amazing that after the submarine had sank two times with two crews, that they went, they got they got volunteers, went out a third time. These men had no doubt, you know, the risk they were putting their lives in on going on this mission. Uh, and just you know, without the the, the the risk of their lives, the uh, the claustrophobia inside this submarine, uh, you know, it's, I think we're losing. I think we can do it the stop the killer structure on the crank. Have you got a chance to figure out what that is? That's one of the first things that came up that you saw. Circular found. structure on the crank. And one of your first press releases, you, you talked about finding a structure on the crank and not being able to define what it was. Okay. Um, you may ask them to stop the rock. I think we now know as a canteen. We recovered it. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a total of three canteens in the submarine, two of which we recovered. Uh, these things have been fused to, uh, they're made out of tin, but they fuse to uh, the iron um, you know, on the crank. They've also been fused to the uh, bottom of the submarine. Um, we also see now that uh, from the crank, you can stop it for a few minutes. Well, the drill, it, we're not going to get away with it with the drill going. So, yeah, we okay. have to stop it for a second. Okay. Excuse me. Rolling again. Okay. okay. Circular sucker. Uh, circular um, object on the crank, uh, uh, where we had some canteens that were concreted there. Uh, we also can see now too that uh, 
the, um, since the hand crank is off center, it's off to one side, off to the uh, more more to the uh, starboard side in the port. Um, they had to um, transfer that power through gears to uh, the propeller shaft, which is central um, in the stern. So there is a, a gear at the end of the um, crank. This transfers energy to another gear, which transfers it to the uh, propeller shaft. Okay. I want to ask you about the state of preservation of the sub. I want to ask you, in your estimation, how long was it before that sub was completely covered in, in silt and was working toward an anaerobic state? Well, the submarine was covered um, relatively quickly, well, certainly very, very quickly in geological terms, and that's aided, to the, that's aided in the preservation of the hull itself and, and the fragile artifacts inside. You know, this is still some of the questions we, you know, we want to answer. Our research is preliminary. Uh, we have a geologist uh, who's actually here today working with us. But uh, we, we can say this much in just relatively, relative terms. It appears that the submarine was completely covered within 20 years. Uh, we can look at coral. We've looked at a number of things to determine this, but one of the chief things is the, the, the colonization of coral on the upper part of a submarine. We can see uh, a period colonization colonies that lasted five years, uh, it lasted 10 years, and then lasted 15 or 20 years. And this is progressively from, say, midpoint on the sub to the very tip top of the submarine. At the very tip top of the sub, you're looking at a probably 15, 20 year lifespan for this coral before it was buried, and there was no second colony, set colonization periods on it. Uh, you know, we can also see that from the inside, too, uh, quite a story in geology, uh, which again, we, we, we haven't fully interpreted, but we can see that a lot, you know, there is strata that can tell us about the fill, filling sequence inside the submarine and how quickly uh, the materials inside were buried, the bodies of the men. Uh, and it has all aged the state of preservation by this quick burial sequence. The submarine was in a um, was in an environment uh, in which the oxygen was deplenished, anaerobic, uh, without uh, you know in this anaerobic environment, bacteria and such that normally would degrade uh, leather and wood, uh, textiles, uh, uh, you know, doesn't survive. Uh, so it also slows down the corrosion rate of the metal. Uh, you know. Uh, for metal to, cor uh, to corrode, it, it, you know, ox oxygen has to be there, um, and so by bur quick burials, you know, we got very good preservation of um, all the metals in the submarine, principally the iron, uh, and all the organic materials too. The the submarine itself, uh, the hull plates are three eighths inch thick pieces of wrought iron. Uh, you know, we knew before we recovered it from ultrasonics so that there was nowhere was it less than three eighths of an inch thick, uh, you know, which gives a lot of confidence that it wasn't going to break apart when we uh, looked at the submarine. Um, and did that have to do with the fact that it was, that, that level of preservation of the metal really had to do with the anaerobic state, that the fact that it was completely covered in uh, sediment? Yes, exactly. That's exactly it. it was in a, the metal was in an anaerobic state. The corrosion rate was, uh, you know, reduced substantially in that state. It also uh, formed a, a, what we call a concretion over the, uh, over the metal. This metal uh, uh, corrodes in salt water. It attracts little bits of sand and shell to it. Uh, it's like a little concrete layer. This, obviously, when this layer forms over the submarine, it uh, doesn't allow as much oxygen to get to the metal of the submarine as before. And this, again, helps to protect the, uh, the submarine. It creates an anaerobic environment. But the burial, uh, you know, below three to five foot of sediment um, preserve the submarine, the metal, and its artifacts for 135 years. Well, let me ask one more question. How long do you think it took for the sediments to fill the interior? Well, we don't know. But we, we certainly know that it had to fill before the, uh, the whole submarine was, was filled. Um, but that's one of the questions we're going to answer with the geology of the submarine. Great. That's wonderful. I really thank you for your time. Okay. That's, uh, that's